<laughs> hey guys, welcome back to the Rhythm Section, brought to you by The Mind Refinery. I'm Kyle Bodanis. This week, Coburn and I discuss Evermore, Taylor Swift's uncharacteristically quick follow-up to her last album, Folklore. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and if you have time, follow The Mind Refinery on social media. And now, here's the show. All right, guys, joining me as always is fellow host, the incomparable Coburn Blair. Coburn Blair, how are you doing? Doing great. How about you? Uh, it's a, a frigid day in the city. Uh, was out uh, on set. It was uh, uh, unnecessarily cold, I think is the, uh, I hope, hopefully you uh, had stayed in the whole time, didn't have to quite deal with it. Yes, I've not been outside in a long time. Good man. That's what you got to do. Do not go outside right now. Um, so before we get into Evermore, you know, there's news from the Taylor Swift Scooter Braun controversy. You may remember Scooter Braun purchased Big Red Machine, which was the label that owned the rights to much of Taylor Swift's uh, catalog. So on November 22nd, it was announced that Braun has sold the catalog to Ithaca Holdings, Inc. So he's gotten rid of it. You may remember Swift was uh, not impressed about the ownership. Uh, it was a $300 million sale. So this is the uh, the latest twist in the in the Taylor Swift uh, Scooter Braun saga. I believe it kind of ends it. Like, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's it's interesting. Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, characterizing Scooter Braun as a bad guy here. And I think, you know, maybe that is a fair comparison. But he's also just being a shrewd businessman, I guess. And if you were looking at it from that perspective. So Taylor Swift, it looks like she wants to re- re- re-record some of her songs so she can own the master version and then get those versions licensed out so that she would kind of re- regain the income to her. Uh, it's it's a tricky situation. Um, we're watching a lot of artists sell off their catalogs now. I don't quite know what it means. Like, there's a lot of speculation on why artists are doing it. You know, we saw Bob Dylan. I think he sold his for reportedly five hundred million or something like that. And then reports leaked last week of Little Wayne selling his uh, for about a hundred million to Universal Music Group. So it's interesting. Um, you know, Scooter had them for how long like over a year or something like that and then and yeah. sold them and made a quick 300 million so it's interesting there's i guess now it's not in you know the scooter braun versus taylor swift now it's kind of taylor swift versus this nameless faceless entity ithaca holdings or whatever um yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see what she does and if she does record we record her her works what, what do you think do you think she will uh yeah, she's gonna re-record her works. I know that she's actually I think nearing completion on some of it. I think there was just news about that recently. It is a shrewd business deal. I mean, this isn't quite as bad as Paul McCartney advising Michael Jackson to uh invest in back catalogs of um you know, of well seasoned and important musicians and then Michael Jackson trying to buy the Beatles back catalog. Um so I mean it's not like as skullduggerous as that, but it's a it's a shrewd business move, but I think it really kind of goes back to the idea of the whole way the music business is set up with not owning your masters, owning your masters. What is the deal with that? I mean, we saw Prince struggle with that for a long time. He said, if you don't own your masters, you don't own nothing. Um, and I think that if you're an artist, your masters are your own, are really your actual marketable commodity. That is what they are. That is what your like your it's your creative work that's what it is and it's i your think stock too though it's it's like absolutely it's... but i think with bob dylan is like he's getting like he's getting on now and yeah. it's like are you going to pass that and at what point is there going to be any um you know loss on that investment is is there going to be a point where bob dylan's catalog isn't worth something where maybe no people don't like i know that's a big thing and it's bob dylan is a generational singer and all-time an all-time great and one of the most influential musicians in popular culture, but I'm wondering if it's like this is the time to cash in and make sure that his progeny and grandkids are all taken care of. Like I, I, I like I don't know I don't know what the personal attachment is for some artists. Like for Lil Wayne, I, like it really felt like a business decision because like at some point, are you going to turn in on that investment? We also don't know what their individual. Uh, monetary situations are yeah i think that's a good point as well and like a lot of people that i've talked to the kind of thing that they're thinking is that you know you get that 100 million dollars or 500 million dollars or whatever up front and you can do a lot with that liquid asset whereas having your masters out there or you know your percentage out there 
Um, they only bring you in a certain amount of money a year, and that's kind of a, a fixed amount. It doesn't really vary that much. Um, someone like Bob Dylan, I'm sure, is getting covered a lot. Mr. Tambourine Man, uh, you know, whatever songs, you know, end up in car commercials or movies or, you know, I think, didn't he have a song in, like, yeah, Watchmen and whatever. But, like, that's yeah. a, a very, like, fixed amount, and probably at his age, he could do a lot more with having, like, $500 million in the bank liquid, and he can invest that and you know, do whatever he wants with it as opposed to, I don't know, the couple million he probably gets a year off of owning all that stuff. So I think it's interesting with some of the younger artists, and we've seen, like, um, Taylor Swift's ex, right? Calvin Harris sold his earlier this year, I believe. Yeah. If you're at that age of an artist, too, you can sell that catalog, and you can start a new catalog, and then that will accrue money and in, in stuff for you. So... It, I think it might be a good business move, and I think it is interesting to look at music business as a business. And you know, you have these artists kind of come from obscurity, and they sign these deals. You know, when their their idea of what their masters are isn't really a thing, and then you kind of gain fans, you you get popularity, and you've kind of traded your rights to your art away to this like label, and then they kind of hold that over you, and then you have no access to your art, but. Again, like you signed the contract, so how do you get out of you know signing those contracts when you don't have any leverage over the companies or the lawyers or whoever's behind the the deal? Yeah, I think that the part of the musician that lingers after they're gone is the work and what is the public's perception of it and like how much they treasure it and how important it is to popular music moving forward. I don't know if Lil Wayne is making an assessment of that and feels that it's better to cash in now. Uh, again, as I said, we don't really know what his uh, monetary situation is, so it could be an instance of uh, like me selling my guitar years ago because just like money was in a pinch, and you know sometimes when you know things aren't great, it's or you have debt uh, to deal with. Um, sometimes you're you're going to do de- desperate things, but you know for Taylor Swift and I think artists moving forward that they're again we are post Prince. And uh, there is a far greater understanding of the importance of, you know, a far greater important uh, understanding of the importance of your masters and what they mean and that being your marketable commodity and that being like really your only marketable commodity if you've been a musician your entire life. So I can see why she'd be angry. There was probably the the understanding and the decision that was talked about when even when she was younger was that she would eventually buy those and... I don't think she assumed Scooter Braun would be the guy who did it. And that kind of maybe broke just like what her like overall plans were. You know what I mean? Because like when you enter into the music industry as a young person, I mean, you're not really thinking about, you know, the label ties and the label ownership of your music. So I think that maybe this was just a situation that she feels Scooter Braun got into. And as a result, you know, she's like, I want to just re-record my catalog which is a shrewd business move on her, you know, on her part. But it's, I mean, it's always a dicey situation. It's never not when it comes to these things. I mean, except I guess in the Bob Dylan situation where it's just a clean sale, you know. Um, we 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 both felt it was important to you know to kind of talk about that because you know she continues to create you know this body of music. You know, as we go into this album evermore, you know, I want to preface this conversation with a talk about lockdown as a moment in popular music. You know, much has been said about folklore and it being the quintessential lockdown album and now evermore following suit. But the output across popular popular music, you know, notably like hip hop um, and, you know, and really across genres, like, for example, uh, Paul McCartney's album was written in complete isolation and some critics are saying it's the best work he's put out in years. Um, I know, you know, we're still kind of in it, but how do you think the lockdown will be remembered as a musical moment? You know, what do you think its effect on popular music will be? Well, I think, you know, we're seeing some artists who are putting out work uh, despite this. I know personally that there's a lot of artists who scrap their plans and are kind of just uh, waiting and holding off on doing anything during it. I think it really speaks to, you know, the type of artist. Um, and how they personally are reacting to it and, you know, the type of music that they want to make. I think for some people, it's a really creative moment and they can kind of have the time to just go into themselves and and create and and pour into themselves and they don't have the distractions of everything else going on. And I think some artists kind of need the distraction to pull from themselves and and, uh, bring us new bodies of work. So I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, 
on the other side of this, whatever post lockdown looks like, you know, what kind of art we get or what kind of um, music that we get that reflects on the moment that we're in now. I definitely think you're going to have to look at it when, you know, in two years from now, when hopefully things are better and what the music will be like then. Uh, we touched on the role of isolation in music with a review of folklore uh, a few months ago. You know, one of the examples I briefly touched on is Nebraska by Bruce Springsteen. Although it wasn't meant to be an isolation album, Springsteen often lamented time he would waste in the studio, you know, kind of writing stuff, you know, on the fly without stuff actually pre-written. So him and Silvio and the rest of the E Street band would write and jam together and just kind of create the stuff. So this time, you know, he locked himself in his apartment with a four-track recorder and knocked out a demo that looked at the dark side of America. So these are significantly darker than the rest of its catalog. Some of them became Born in the USA, which creates an interesting musical what-if, considering that the demos were later released as, uh, that were later released as Nebraska kind of failed to stick when presented to the rest of the band. So the idea was he presented them to the rest of the band. They jammed on them, and they didn't really work because they were almost too sad and mournful, whereas some of the stuff that became Born in the USA kind of worked. So they released all these, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen released all these demos as Nebraska, and it ended up being this completely different note in his life uh, and his, his musical career. So, I mean, Isolation there did something. I mean, although, you know, Radiohead recorded OK Computer, they got an old house near Bath, locked themselves away with producer Nigel Goodrich, you know, knocked out one of the great all-time albums. You know, even Jay Dilla put together Donut in Isolation all by his lonesome. You know, so there's a rich tradition of Isolation being a conduit for really good fucking music. Interestingly enough, uh, Bonnie Iver is on this album, and Justin Vernon wrote for Emma forever ago while at his dad's hunting lodge, and he kind of just hunted venison to supplement his supplies when his dad wasn't there and he was sick, had a liver infection and just got into that headspace. And that album really kind of dictated where they went. And obviously Justin Vernon, big contribution to this. And I, I think this is really the first time in history where pop artists have been forced into solitude on mass. I think it directly correlates to how the good the music has been in the last year. I mean, it's really a tight year for releases across the board genre wise. And I think that will be acknowledged when we look back. We have an entire community of artists forced to put together music in situations that they're not used to, you know, forcing them out of their comfort zone and like getting outside of your comfort zone is always the most important, you know, it's important for good music happening. Do you think that the lockdown works better for genres like folk than like other genres? I mean, yes. I mean, I, I, it feels like it would be because folk music is more of an, is more of an isolated genre anyways you know what i mean like i feel like you get these moments of bob dylan going up to his you know cottage alone in upstate new york and writing there and and kind of just being by yourself but then you have i, I feel like the hip-hop has been really good as well the benny the butcher's album was fantastic with with the benny the butcher album too i think it's it's been really good for storytelling oriented music i think I think that's what I'll say, like in, in terms of like folk and like, you know, the boom bapness that we we feel on Benny the Butcher album. I think there's like a lot of space for music that, you know, is a little bit more still and a little bit more kind of focused and a little bit more emotive. Uh, no, I agree. Absolutely. And I think like two country music and hip hop are two of the great American storytelling genres. And they lend themselves to moments alone where you can write. I mean, if you give an artist like Taylor Swift, you know, who is used to being under immense pressure to deliver on a regular basis, who often has years of her life planned out way ahead, like two years ahead, um, you know, it, it, that rare commodity of time, the result is going to be something like this. And despite what some people think, I think... Kid Cudi's new album, Man on the Moon 3, is another example of that. It forces the artist to point inwards. For Kid Cudi, that works for him because that's the headspace he often occupies. So it gives you an opportunity to do that. And since when do these artists ever get forced to just be off the road, not be with a bunch of people, not be at a bunch of, you know, industry-forced things? Especially someone like Taylor Swift, who is completely, you know, part of of mainstream music, you know, Western mainstream music. And I, I, I think... The, it, time again is a rare commodity and you give it to them and things happen and it, it again puts it out of their comfort zone and i think that you're going to 
I think that you will look back at that as as something that was very unique in this time. I mean, we're going to get you know later to whether or not this album is part of a different movement in t- in Taylor Swift's career that I believe is up for debate or whether it's just something brief. Again, we will get to that, but um I think it feels like there was a lot of really good music put out and it was of a different nature than maybe the music that would have come out normally. Maybe that's just me being in it, not having perspective yet. I feel like you're correct in that. We'll still have, we'll have to see what the post lockdown music will be like to contrast it to the lockdown music. Yeah. I think that'll be really the only way to gauge. Should we, should we dig into this album though? Yes. So Evermore was framed as a sister album to Folklore. What was our initial thoughts on this album? And like, what was the difference? Like, if they're very similar, but there is marked difference. Like, what were the differences for you between this and its predecessor? I I found them to be like of an equal timber. Um, I could see how this album kind of like spun off of Folklore a little bit. Um... I feel like there was a little bit more of a stillness kind of throughout this album. Um, and I, I enjoyed too that she kind of reached a little bit outside of her bubble for features, like seeing Haim on there, the national, you know, kind of getting into that realm. I think she's really like leaning hard in, into this folk thing, which is an interesting turn from Taylor. And I wonder, you know, if she'll ever kind of, move out of this or or give us more of the pop from her that we're used to. And if this is going to be an era or if this is going to be a direction, a long-term direction. This album isn't quite as tight as folklore is. I folklore. And as we get into our year end uh, kind of wrap up in the next few weeks, folklore was one of my favorite albums of the year, but this is, I feel this is a bit more expansive. Uh, she gets a little more bouncy at times, presses the pop buttons a little bit more. I think you get an even deeper of glimpse into her talent as a songwriter and as a storyteller, which really plays into her roots growing up in the country music world. I feel like this out, al- these two albums have a lot more to do with what she was doing on fearless and bits and pieces of red than the albums that came after them. Um, I think if you took a more heavy handed approach to this album, it would end up sounding like, uh, you know, one of her, we, like if you really, really push the pop sensibilities, more yeah. like it, it, like you could make it one of the newer uh you know one of the newer songs or you know one of the more recent albums because she's she's dabbling in it right like she's like giving yeah. you those elements but she's not she's like kind of like yeah you're right i think it's like the the kind of the lever the knob is like kind of turned down on it but it's, it would be possible to like you know o- overproduce and kind of give you way more pop oh 100 you can do it because she's still like at the end of the day i mean she was really imbued in those like quiet soft dynamics you know really making those like soaring choruses, but sort like soaring choruses where the band comes in and you know, the, they start, it starts really, really, you know, really chugging, but the creative choices on this are com- with a completely different mentality than the creative choices on other albums. It's almost like there was the same rough structures, but they chose and they, including, you know, Aaron Desner, Vernon's, uh, you know, work on it. And I think that, you know, and Jack Jack Antonoff too. He's kind of the through line through her albums, and I think it's just because of the level level of comfort she has, um, you know, in that musical collaboration. But uh, like again, the question is: Is this going to continue? Again, we will get into that. But I I think that there is moments on this that are a lot more <clears throat> that are a lot less subtle than on folklore. I loved folklore. I love this album too, but. Um, I definitely think taking the time to explore some of these collaborations too, like Haim, that was really cool. I thought that actually just completely made sense. Bon Iver, fantastic. I mean, like actually with the national um, on a track for this. And I mean, and even working with, you know, Bryce Desmer, Desner, you know, with his string arrangements, I thought were fantastic. So, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of interesting how this came together. It's interesting when contrasted against its, predecessor this is the fastest she's ever put out a um you know a a response to a previous work i want to get into the tracks though like what for you are the standout tracks on this i i kind of really enjoyed the christmas song on this album 
I also like that she kind of did the same thing she did on Folklore, where she has these stories that are told, you know, through multiple perspectives on different songs of the album. You know, how, like, Tis the Season connects with Dorothea, and the characters are uh, in both songs. Um, I'm a big, obviously, Bonnie Bonnie Vare fan, so I enjoyed um, Closure, or Evermore, and then Closure. I think Closure is probably one of my favorite songs on the album, and then I like, obviously, Willow, Ivy. Yeah, I thought, I thought, yeah, I think I liked a lot of songs on this album. It's incredible how well she works with these people. Like, given if you, the, given the musical output pre this year, I mean, I enjoy Willow. Willow was fantastic. An interesting song to start the album with because, like, from a rhythmic, bare-bones perspective, it's a lot like her more pop-oriented stuff. It's just sonically acoustic rather than using, you know electronic drums and stuff and a heavy beat she's usually she's just using you know bass drum acoustic guitar and it's really 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 good it really kind of sets the tone for it but then it leaves it open to be a little bit more bouncy than its predecessor uh gold rush is my favorite track on this whole thing uh the vocal mixing is some of the best i've heard in a while uh the swelling again bryce desner uh his string arrangements are super fucking cool they're just fantastic and just like the just the way they're slipping in harmonized vo- like her harmonizing herself and like slipping them very very quietly into the background so they almost feel like haunting i really enjoy how like they did that and then like the haim collaboration which i thought was really cool i mean that song could have been on fearless yeah i mean songs yeah. like this are why i'm kind of encouraged by this musical direction because like all her post fearless work with the exception of some of red um, is engineered to kind of increase her star power and status, you know. So that's why I feel like you're seeing the, you know, the changes in genre, of, not genre, but like stylistic changes from album to album. So like now that she's at the top, you know, I feel like there may be a movement back into wanting to do that and to embrace her more country and folk roots. Because I mean, country is a hop, skip, and a, and a jump away from folk. I mean, any of the early, you know, any of the like very popular folk musicians like Bob Dylan, you know, like Simon and Garfunkel really tied to people like Woody Guthrie. Um, so, you know what I mean? So there's that natural connection. So that's why this kind of felt like it would go well. Like, I feel like she could work with Jeff Tweedy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wilco. Like, it would really make kind of sense. And the big thing is that on Fearless, you know, even songs that start out quietly, you know, they become loud and anthemic uh, when the guitar and drum ramps up. Whereas these songs, when they're about to ramp up, rely more on like piano and strings to do the heavy lifting, so to speak. Not that there isn't strings under previous works, they're just used in a far more restrained manner and far more solemn in the mood, you know what I mean? Like, there's flourishes of this on Red 2 on tracks like um, I Almost Do and Sad, Beautiful, Tragic. Um, and then the Coney Island featuring the National was fantastic. Like, what did you think about that, the the Coney Island, the National collaboration? Like, how well do you think what she does dovetails into what they do? I'm actually not, like, that big of a, a National fan. I enjoy the song but i i don't know i don't i don't think I've, I've always loved like their voice um of the lead singer in the national is it too is it too do you think it's too somber yeah i find it like somber and like gravelly and it's not like you know i have like i think i have like a few of their albums that i've tried to listen to over the years and nothing has really ever like took hold of me and i know like you know i've been listening to them before but i just never really got into them i definitely think bon iver is just a little bit more spruced up. The National is very somber. I can't do it over and over again. You know what I mean? I can't like listen to it for long periods of time. I have to be in a very specific mood to listen to the National. I feel this way about Bonnie Vare too, but I think they're, I mean, what do you think is, what do you think it is with Bonnie Vare? I think with Bonnie Vare, uh, Justin, Justin Vernon, I don't know. He's like, it's cool to see him be able to do something like this. And then, you know, it's a such a big leap from his work on Yeezus. And it's a big leap from, you know, what he does on his albums, and he can just insert himself creatively into so much different situations, and he can still pull out um, something new and that fits and that is, you know, relevant to what he's working on. And I think that really makes him a standout. I also think he's, I mean, some people would say if you're in the know, this is not true, but I do think from a pop music standpoint, he is, you know, Justin Vernon is super 
um, underappreciated. I think he could be appreciated more. I think he's very versatile. I think that I think you hit that. The national can be sometimes. I like. I think Aaron Desner's contribution to this as a producer, especially and a songwriter, is super important. Yeah. Um. But when it's actually like fully gripping the national aesthetic, if that makes any sense at all, whereas Bon Iver and Justin Vernon like can like there's a little malleability with them, a little bit more adaptable to who they're working with. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So uh, we've been discussing this before. Like, so very simply, is this a tangent or a sign of a completely different road that Swift has begun? Because we we've been talking about is this going to be something that stays? Is this going to be something that doesn't? Um, this album turned out the way it did because of you know who she round, surrounded herself with. I think Kanye West is another person who made sure he surrounded himself with the right people for kind of what he wanted to achieve artistically. Um, and like with Aaron Desner and like the people we've been talking about and Justin Vernon, like, do you think this is part of a longer partnership or is this a flash in the pan? Um, like, what do you think? I don't know. Like, I think I want to ask you a question. Like, do you think we needed this album so soon after after Folklore? I mean, I don't necessarily need any. No, I need anything until it's given to me. Yeah. Listen, my whole thing is her her explanation of it was it's like lightning in a bottle we were really enjoying the music we made on folklore the reaction was great and we just kind of wanted to continue with it so she put it out like i really like it i like that she kind of is playing in that space and that she's encouraged by playing in that space because i kind of love it when she's in this space so i want to see more do we need it i don't know i wasn't like fuck i want to hear more taylor swift music i was still kind of enjoying folklore not that this is infringed upon that enjoyment at all but i do think that now that it's here, I'm very happy with it. And I'm, I was also, again, you know, and I kind of pointed this out on the previous podcast, the folklore podcast that I'm worried about this music, not coming out anymore. And that her going back to the previous stuff, which would make some people happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think this is kind of a way for Taylor to, you know, grow her artistic persona um, a way for her to evolve in music and I think it, it's a lane that makes sense and it's palatable to you know a wide audience so I do think this is you know a, a new direction and I think this is like a perfect way for someone you know who had that pop um, relevance and you know was around in that pop era and the country era to grow her music up um, so I think it's it's a way for her to, to mature, and I think this is really working, and I think she's going to stick with this. Like, do you think this is a natu- This is natural for her. Like, if you listen to the first two albums, especially Fearless, I feel like this makes sense. I don't know. I want to say maybe not natural, but I would say it fits. And, you know, we can see how her songwriting has evolved and, you know, transcended throughout the years. Um, And I think she is kind of leaning into this like aesthetic, you know, I've seen people call it like cottage core or whatever. Um, Did you just say cottage core? Yes. That's what people have like dubbed the whole kind of like, you know, by the fire and plaid and like the braids and this like kind of like it's like a general generation Z term. I believe it's even on the the Wikipedia for this album. I Uh, am definitely going to be looking at I feel like I'm definitely gonna be looking at cottage core slash starting a cottage core band continue. So it's like an like, I think they describe it as an, an idealization of rural life developed throughout the 2010s on um, um, and it was named and think uncoined on on Tumblr. So it's like foraging, baking, pottery, that kind of like aesthetic. So I think that is kind of where she is fitting into now and it does fit. I don't want to say it's like completely natural, but I do think it is a way f- that she something that she's grown into. And that it does fit, but I do think it's something that she's leaned into and it's a very purposeful direction that she's going in. Like for me, all these other albums that she put out, like Lover, you know, and even 1989, which is a great album, but like just the manner with which it's presented, like to me, that feels like a calculated choice to push her star power. And I think like, okay, so... Like, I like this version of Taylor Swift. I don't want it to go away. However, I have two minds of this. So, 
that documentary uh, on Taylor Swift, Miss Americana, which obviously she pushed and was, you know, in the, she wanted to do it. Uh, and it was her idea. Uh, kind of painted her as this person in need of catharsis, looking to, you know, purge the way of life, the way her, you know, the way of life has been, a life that was kind of created by her ambition and, of course, the label ambition as well. Um, nobody really knows what it's like until it happens. I think that is the thing, is because if you watch Miss Americana, you're like, oh, whoa, with me, you know, she's successful. But, I mean, I think she kind of pushed for something that she didn't know what the nature of it was, and I think that she's burnt out by she was burnt out by that at least that's what's presented and it could be a very calculated marketing situation in the um it almost feels like a a, a career palate cleanser and i think that taylor swift after that found this group of people like aaron desner and her boyfriend um you know joe alwyn which who was um what was his name on this he was character it was william bowery he was credited as and everyone kind of thought that it could be the pen name for her boyfriend. And, you know, they've been in a relationship for a while, and, you know, she had said that she didn't think that she would ever write with her boyfriend if it wasn't for Locked, because he's an actor. Like, why would you? Like, I would if I'm an actor and I have any kind of self-actualization, I'm not going to be like, yo, I think I should uh, write you with you some stuff. It's just she kind of heard him playing some stuff, and they had some ideas, and they just kind of talked about it organically. And, you know, and Jack Antonoff, obviously part of this, Evermore is the fastest she's ever recorded and released a new album. There's no dynamic, dramatic, sorry, not dynamic, dramatic shift here in sound from its, you know, pre, from its predecessor. I feel like with this, she's unburdened currently by the weight of expectations a bit. And also she found that, you know, writing with these people was good. So I'm hoping that that is a, a, a situation that continues but I think that a lot of the, the more pop stuff in the in the later 2010s was more of a construction than the other stuff. But for me, this work is more akin to like works like Fearless. It's just that the kind of thing obviously is substan- like it's substantially more mature and you know gothic in terms of its imagery. And I don't mean gothic like ministry kind of gothic, but more this like time period of American life and like looking at it like the country or cottage core, if you will. Um, you know, the second that this is just, is the second mind is that this is just a musical phase and this is all just a calculation. And I'm not saying the work involves less artistry. I just think that this hit an emotional chord and is substantially better than her previous work. And this just may have been a creative that she wanted to scratch. And, you know, she's going to continue with, uh, Jack Antonoff, uh, through the, you know, as the through line, but I, you know, but just kind of go back to other collaborations that are more pop oriented and all the historical evidence in her career. says that this is a, is a distinct possibility. This may be the kind of music she actually wants to make and that pop is more of a business decision. But I, I mean, I'm not too sure because I feel like she's a marketing genius. So I don't know if we can ever know if it's real. And I mean, you can never really understand artistic intention anyways. Yeah. Well, you're selling a story and you're selling, you know, an identity too right so but like i, like I think this is like a, a way that she can transition forward and her fans can kind of go along with it right like there's so much room for her fans to like grow and age up with this music as opposed to you know if she's still doing just mainly pop stuff i've talked to some fans about this album because i'm very curious just about how, what the you know and there's thoughts that it's good music but some of the really diehard Taylor Swift fans I talk to, they kind of wish, you know, that it could be that they prefer the more pop, um, the more bright, poppy type music. And I don't know, like, what, like, what are your, like, which incarnation of her do you prefer? Do you prefer this one? Do you prefer the earlier stuff? Because I know when we talked about folklore, um, you had said I haven't lived with it enough. You know what I mean? To kind of, and like, to compare it to, in, in terms of comparing it to other her previous works. Yeah, so I, I think, like, you know, now I've kind of sat with that album, and, and it also just sounds a lot better in this kind of winter-fall period that we're currently sitting in. Um, and I think this album will kind of do the same and take us through, like, there's a Christmas song on it, it'll take us through that period. I think this is my favorite inc- inclination of Taylor Swift, because I've always, lo- like, you know, loved her songwriting and, you know, the poetry that she kind of uses and fuses into her her work so i think this for me like fits with my sensibilities and i'm a big fan of folk music and i like the pace and i like the tones 
So I think this is probably like what speaks to me the most. And this is what I'll be continuing to listen to more so than even like some of her big pop uh, stuff in her previous albums. And this is where, for me, the comparison to Nebraska comes from, because I also think it's a personal comparison, because, uh, and you can at me uh, about it, uh, I'm not really a big fan of Bruce Springsteen. I find a lot of his stuff just, I'm like, nah. You don't like the boss? I mean, I'm not, like, I'm not really <laughs> into the boss. You know what I mean? Like, also, like, I'm trying to get to work the next day. I don't need, like, a fucking 15-minute version, 20-minute version of Rosalita what I'm trying to like get a show. I have seen him live. He's incredible live. Like the East Street Band's incredible You're live. You're like effectively banned from New Jersey now. Just no, so yeah, you know. I can't go to fucking New Jersey, but I can't go back to New Jersey anyways because their other favorite son, Bon Jovi, I just talk so much shit about that it's ridiculous and I don't care how much people think Slippery When Wet is incredible. I can't stand <laughs> it. Um, I, I think with, with Bruce Springsteen, I mean, like his message is good. I just don't like the packaging like Born in the USA. Born in the USA is a song you know, about Vietnam veterans coming back to America, downtrodden, can't find a job, and it's really, like, music of the working class. Like, you obviously, mean it's not, I like, can... a Trump campaign song? You can just play yeah, it. I, I, it's not, like, I was, like, so flabbergasted. I'm like, why would you think that, uh, it's like, obvi- or obviously there's a Trump we don't give a fuck. Yeah. But, you know, you see this with Republicans all the fucking time, and you see this with Democrats, too. I mean, like, none of them are really good, but, you know, the, this co- co-opting of music. But, like, I love the bruce springsteen message i don't often like the delivery i like it when he's working in an acoustic somber space i love the ghost of tom joad that's where i like him and this is the same thing with taylor swift because i think i mean and and even with this it's like expanding from that it's not just like it's her with a guitar there's a lot of you know producing involved with it too because she's an artist of a very high caliber which is going to happen at all, you know, with artists of high caliber. But I, I like what they did here. I love listening to this. I'm always going to listen to these two albums. And I never thought that if you told me five years ago that, you know, one of my favorite albums of the year 2020 was going to be a Taylor Swift album, I would have been like, you're out of your mind. Like, what did she completely change her sound? The answer to that question is yes. Yep. And I really hope that she maintains that because I think this music is really special. I legitimately think that. And it should be like those like tombstone albums that go on your, that are like, this is what you did. That would be it. Because I think it very much connects to what she used to be and her roots. And I think this is probably more authentic than her other music because everything else seems like a calculation. So we rated the other one folklore highly. Uh, what is our official patented mine refinery cog rating forevermore? I think I'll give this a 7.9 for me. A 7.9? 7. 7.9. 7. Uh, I think that's, I think that's not, what's your reason for giving it a lower, like this being a sister album, what's your reason for giving this a lower mark than folklore? I think for me, part of it is it's a little bit too soon. I think following folklore I think it's a, a great album. I think it's like, you know, right there on the cusp. And I believe she's going in a great sonic direction. I don't think it, you know, has maybe the power that I found in uh, Folklore. So I think it's it's near that, that, though, but it's not quite there for me. Can I, I'm going to ask you a question because I had contemplated this as well. Do you think part of that is the f- shock value of hearing Folklore for the first time? And like, I was kind of like, what the fuck is this? In a good way. Yeah, I think I think that kind of, you know, that's where I'm kind of... It's not like a bad thing. I just think, you know, just give us, like, two albums in, like, you know, that shorter window, and they're kind of very similar. Like, this almost feels like a, a B-side to Folklore in a it lot of definitely, ways. It definitely feels like that. I, I would say it definitely feels like that. I think now that she's in that space, you're judging her by that space. Yeah, you know, like, I wonder if these songs were, like, on the cutting room floor or were, like, rough ideas for folklore. And she's like, oh, why don't we just like, put together an album? Like, you know, it's, like, lockdown when there's nothing else going on. So I feel like that's kind of an aspect of it. Or she picked, like, you know, the kind of more upbeat stuff that, like, didn't really fit on folklore and put it, put it together. Um, Which is not, like, a bad thing. It's, like, it's a good album. It's just, I think it's not quite at where folklore was for me. I feel the same. I think, I'm just curious. I was curious as to what your thought process was with it because i feel like i mean you know what i really like to do i wish i could kind of like go back in time and listen to this one first and then folklore and then think because that would really kind of suss out if it was shock value uh so much because like i really did enjoy this album i'm giving it an eight 
Um, which so we're pretty much giving it the same thing. I enjoyed it. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as folklore. That doesn't mean this isn't a great album. It's now being judged against its predecessor. And its predecessor is her best album of all time. And I gave it a nine last time. So uh, I, I think it's better than anything she's done so far. I think Evermore is my second favorite Taylor Swift album. But I, I just hope she maintains this direction. Yeah, agreed. Mr. Coburn, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we got to get going. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah.